and their um, and children and others, and we had services of baptism. And then after this service, after this time together, uh, the main service, um, or the next main service, I should say, which will be a time of confirmation and reception. And so, um, and this is the kind of rhythm of church life that I am used to and love, which is when a community can have various incarnations of its life and embodiment of its life um, happening concurrently because it says to me that the congregation is healthy enough and is broad enough to be able to encompass a great diversity of life. And that's um, something about St. Columbus to be commended and to cherish and to, and especially coming out of a time when we've had to be so protective and protecting of one another physically, and we've had to um, basically stop doing so many of the things that defined us as Christians or a Christian community and find other ways to be faithful and other ways to pray and other ways to be in relationship with one another. It's really wonderful to see how which of those practices and which of those ways of being church can be given back to us and how they feel differently or how we feel differently having come through what we've experienced in the last few years. All of which, by the way, has been, um, we, there, while there are some universal things about living through the pandemic and all the turbulence in our society and around the world, each one of us has had a particular journey through that, and it's not the same, right? So while we have had some, maybe some common language, some common practices, um, each one of us has come through, is coming through, is living, um, having been affected and changed in, in different ways. And so the first question I'd like to ask you, and you don't have to answer this, but I think it's a helpful um, way of grounding ourselves in our being. And it's a question that I think Thoreau used to ask friends he hadn't seen for a while. Like it was his way of greeting them. And he would ask them, what has become clear to you since last we met? Hmm? The last time I was here on Sunday morning, I'm at St. Columbus a lot for other purposes, but on Sunday morning in worship was in fact Pentecost of 2019, right? So if you think about 2019, the spring of 2019, and what we were anticipating to be our lives in that summer and fall and into the coming year, right? And so it's interesting to think about that, isn't that? Just in terms of, I mean, the, no one in the world even knew what this, 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 this virus, as far as we knew, didn't exist. And then it became dominant in our lives. So as you think about that, just what has become clear to you? or I mean, maybe another way of saying it is like, what clarity did you have before that you had to renegotiate, right? Because some things, what, did you, what have you learned about yourself? Um, what did you learn about your community, however you define community, your family? Um, what did you learn about the country we, uh, we live in and call home? Or what are we learning? And... Um, and as people of faith, you know, we have this quandary of wanting and continuing to affirm all the things we say about God as a source of love and creativity and forgiveness and peace and possibility, you know, all those things, and, and Jesus as a presence in our lives that, um, and the power of the Spirit, all of those things um, which we hold as true, and yet... Um, like any other person of faith living through other ordeals, either across the world or throughout time, we're obviously not spared. We're not inoculated from the rest of what the rest of the world is enduring, right? That that's not what it, whatever it means to be a follower of Jesus. It doesn't mean we get a pass through um, the chances and changes of this life, which is um, for some, and I can certainly understand that, a reason not to believe. In fact, I was just reading a, a book of, from someone, one of the most brilliant thinkers of, that I have come across in, um, in our time, a man by the name of Ta-Nehisi Coates, a black man, profound writer, and he came to the conclusion at an early age that there, he just couldn't, he said, he said in his book, which is just this Eight Years in Power, which is a powerful book, he said, I, I wish I could believe in God. I would like to be a person who believes in God but I can't. And he gave his reasons, right? And you and I could fill in 
all the reasons why, right? That would be true, that why people in our lives, that would be true for them. And maybe even from time to time, and, and maybe even right now, why questions of faith are something we struggle with, because you're just bumping up against the greatest mysteries that cannot be solved with a simple answer, like stick in answer of God here, and that makes everything all right, right? That's not what faith and a life of faith and a living relationship with God does for us. It's just, that's not it. Um, but it is something. And then how do we as people of faith find a way to articulate and embody that faith, which isn't, as one of my teachers said to me early on, changing, believing in God doesn't change the way the world is, but it changes the way you can live in the world, right? So it's not about even, it's changing the way we live in the world. And maybe having the capacity in small ways to honor that force of God that is goodness and love and forgiveness in such a way that we embody it and carry it forth, right? So those are some of the things I've been thinking about, really deep things in some ways as I just try to hold my life together and carry things through and survive and go grocery shopping and all those things. It's like, okay, Lord, how, how am I to live? How are we to live? And um, can I believe that what I've been given, what you all have been given, is exactly what God needs from us to do what we can, right? So as I've pondered these things, I wonder if anyone has any thoughts or reflections that would just give me a sense of where some of you have been in this time. And you can either speak and I can, I mean, do we need the microphone or? I'll repeat it, okay. Does anyone have any, any thoughts that you'd like to share just to give me a sense, give one other sense of what has become clear to you or not clear or what you've been thinking about as you lay your head down at night and offer your prayers? So what is, when your name is? Jen. So what, is, what has become clear to Jen is that we all have to work together to bring about good in this world that one person alone cannot. And a hearty amen to that. Um, and sometimes it's almost like a, a relay race, right? Like I carry it for a while and uh, hopefully there's someone I can hand it off to because I need to take a nap. Or do you know what I mean? I just, there's just, I don't have it anymore. In fact, that happened yesterday. We have our grandkids visiting us, and after about six hours, I remember thinking, I need to go for a walk. <laughs> and my, my husband took over for a bit, but it's that sense of like, okay, you know, we don't have to do everything all by ourselves. Thank you for that. Other thoughts, just where you've been? Yes, Reed. So the question is, do I think as bishop that the churches, I'm assuming our churches, I'll start there, are going to come back from COVID in a strong way? I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. What I'm observing is that um, not everything that we had to let go of before is lost forever. And some things are coming back in a way that feels like actually coming back, right? Um, some things that felt like they were really important before are falling away for some people. Some spiritual practices are changing, lifestyle practices are changing, and they may not result in coming back, um, but new things may be emerging. Um, I would say that whatever trend a congregation was on, before the pandemic, um, the pandemic accelerated, right? In some ways. So uh, particularly if it, was, if it was a time of great adventure and creativity and resilience, they, those congregations could meet the pandemic and it didn't mean that it wasn't hard, but that energy was what they led with or parts of what they led with. But the parts of the congregation that were weaker um, or more tentative, often are having a harder time coming back, right? 
and the smaller congregations that were really weak to begin with, um, many of the things that they were holding on to to be church have completely fallen away. And in some ways that's good news because that allows them to let go of the things that weren't working for them anyway, right? And to be open to something new. So we're kind of all over the map, I would say. Um, in general, the statistics are that sort of coming back to worship on Sunday morning as a spiritual practice is waning among practicing Christians. And that was true before the pandemic, that the average practicing Christian was in church twice a month before the pandemic. And those were like our most, you know, apart from the people who like are either paid to come to church or that's just so deeply ingrained in you that you can't think of anywhere else you would rather be, but you were in a minority before the pandemic. You're in an even greater minority now. And that the average, the people who consider themselves part of the church may be in church one or two times a month. And that the younger you go in generations, the more that is the case. It doesn't mean that people are believing less or that the church in some ways isn't important to them, but it does mean that it's important in a different way and the balance of their lives are different, is different. So we're having to adapt to some of those things um, and to make sure that whenever we gather in church, it's as compelling and as meaningful an experience for whoever shows up, right? I was talking to one other rector really well, wonderful creative rector. In fact, I'm gonna be there next week at St. David's, um, just up the way. And I was talking to Kristen Hawley and that church is, has been really coming alive under her leadership, but she said, I don't know who's gonna show up one week to the next. Do you know? I simply don't know. Um, and she was, the interesting thing about her tone of voice was she wasn't despairing about that, she was curious, right? And also and wondering how can we be just thrilled with whoever shows up and yet flexible enough that we're not counting on a bunch of things to be, you know what I'm saying? It's just an interesting time right now. So hang on to your hats, but that's true across the society, not just the church. How will schools be different? How will hospitals be different? How will, um, how will our political systems be different? All of those things are being evaluated through this lens. Other things that have occurred to you, yes. Come to the microphone. It sounds like you're going, you got something to say. Uh, I wanted to share something. I worked with the fourth and fifth graders in a sight singing class. And we were asked to uh, have this class write a song about the sight singing class. And we were asked to have this class write a song to commemorate this year and also the pandemic year. Yeah. And what struck me about what they wrote, which was so heartfelt, which um, was that um, it, they felt this great sense of loss, but the, the resilience is incredible. And how important St. Columbus was for them. So yes. let me just give you a little bit of what they wrote. So, because I've been over this a lot. So they wrote, uh, for, two long, for two long years, we sang alone, computers, not friends, at our sides, wishing our friends could hear us through the static and the gloom. And, and then the choruses, and now we sing together in one room, be a choir without Zoom. Uh, look each other in the face and give thanks that we are all in one place. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh. That is astonishingly beautiful. And it points to something that I think we all have to take into account, which is the impact that isolation has had on all of us and, on, and in particular on, um, on children and young people. And maybe an old, my, my mother is 90 years old. It, believe me, it had a big effect on her as well. Um, and, and all of us, right? We were, we were talking to our computers most of the time. Now, thank God for that on one level. Thank God that we could sing and have those screens filled with voices and, and faces. And, you know, I mean, that, I mean, think of what our forebears went through in the, in the pandemic of 1918, right? They didn't have any of that. Um, and so just to have those things, for those of us blessed to have them, um, is, but on the other hand, thank God we can be together. Um, and it's going to take some time to see where it lands. There is something, though, that's interesting about trauma. Um, and it has a lot to do with resilience, and it has a lot to do with what happens afterwards. Um, because 
we can, in fact, recover from traumatic experiences. As human beings, we can. Um, and on some level, the severity of the trauma indicates a recovery process. But it also has to do with who's surrounding us during it and as we come through it, and the narrative we can tell about it as a result, right? If we can, if we can create a story of our lives that's big enough to contain the trauma without minimizing it, right? Without having to say it wasn't a good, th it was a good thing when it wasn't, right? Pretending it was a good thing when it wasn't. But having a story of our lives large enough to encompass it and continue on without being defined by it, right? And that's not just true for the pandemic, that's true for anything. And it's a very important life lesson for all of us in terms of both for ourselves as we, and, and this is where a spiritual life can be really helpful, especially a spiritual life rooted in a tradition that does not shy away from pain and suffering, does not minimize it, right? But allows us to take it in, but to create within us a life large enough that we are not solely defined. We lived through it, we were marked by it, we can talk about it and tears may roll down our face, but we are no longer exclusively defined by that experience. Um, now, again, that doesn't hold up for the most severe traumas, and we can only speak about those things in the first person for ourselves. We can never speak for another person. And it's usually not helpful to say to someone when you're in the middle of it, right? Because when you're in the middle of a trauma, what you need is compassion and empathy and someone who's willing to sit down there with you, right? But also one who has the confidence that there's life on the other side, right? Some way or another, we're going to get through this. Um, and yes? The thought that came to mind about a clarity. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. Good um, morning. The, the thought that came to mind for me about a clarity over the last years is just in the midst of so much um, uh, heartache, so much um, um, sickness and um, that how utterly lucky I feel, and some of that is a matter of privilege. Um, mm -hmm. Some of that is just, you know, not having had as much death and, and mm -hmm. illness in our lives. And so, but a clarity of just, and almost feel badly about how lucky we feel to have emerged without, uh, general, with general trauma, but not individualized. I hear that, right. And so, uh, and, the, and the work of this parish to think about those in need, to think about anti-racism, to think about um, uh, given how lucky collectively we tend to be as a, as a parish, but also thinking for me as you know, our family uh, has been very much on my mind. And so that, uh, that was true before the pandemic, but certainly pronounced um, and more clear during the Yeah, I thank you for that. And I, my sense is that that collective awakening um, within us to an awareness that our luck, if you will, was actually based on, is actually based on generational privilege, right? Um, which is different than saying, I was simply fortunate, which I am, in many ways, but also that I stand on a heritage that I had no control over that allowed certain things to be in place for me that they weren't for other people, right? And I believe that these last few years have invited us as a nation to look at that with, with sort of eyes wide open, right? And it's a hard conversation to have for those of us who have been on the privileged side of that because it seems to take away from all the things that we did or the thing, you know, or to minimize the, all of the things, right? Just evokes all of those emotions. And yet it also frees us to have a different conversation about how we go forward and what we are willing to take responsibility for and to change. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's important. And once you've, once you, it, and it's, and we're also experiencing, as happens in, in our, in, it's, it's classic in American history, we come up against it and then there's sort of a massive retreat, right? We come up against a hard truth and then we retreat from it. Um, and, um, and you know, 
that's probably embedded in human defense mechanisms. I, I get it. I, I do some of that in my own life, and I'm sure I do it in other ways, uh, you know, in terms of societal implications. But to stick with it and to stay the course of deep relationships across um, different life narratives feels essential to the time that we're in right now. And I'm really grateful for those of you at St. Columbus who are engaging in that work, um, the anti-racism work and other things, your, your willingness to look at even how this neighborhood came to be and how the houses were built and how the churches were built here. Why, why do we have so many Episcopal churches on Wisconsin Avenue, for example? Um, and, you know, and just as a, you know, what was the mission strategy of the Episcopal Church at the beginning of the 20th century and in the 1950s and, and beyond? And what might we, what might that say about us, about our desire, does, what our responsibility systemically to things and, and what's happening now. I mean, all of those questions are alive and well for us. And, um, and I, I've simply committed myself, and I know you have as well as, as a church, to just stay in the conversation, be learnt, to learn and to take action where it seems that we can do. And be willing to get in the mess of it, right? Because this is messy. Um, and I've been reading this wonderful book called Lean Into the Mess. Right? And it's the idea that when things get hard and messy and complicated and we don't quite know our way, we can do any number of things. One of the things we can do is we can pull back. But another thing we can do is we can kind of hang in with it, right? And the book is written on the metaphors of jazz music and the places where jazz musicians get when they're in, when they're in a set together and, one, and they don't know where they're going. Right? And they've got to, and I'm not a jazz musician, but I was just so intrigued by this. And they've got to figure out where to go next. And part of it is staying there until the new riff or the new rhythm, it's usually a rhythm emerges that allows them to get out of it. And I thought, wow, I'm going to hang, I'm going I'm to hang on to that because it's just something about perseverance. So thank you for, for the sharing and for the um, acknowledgement. Others? Yes. If yes, please. So others can hear who are listening in. There have been excuse me, there have been a few times in my life when I was really proud to be an Episcopalian. And the two most recent ones that come to mind were when um, Bishop Curry went and did the wedding ceremony for uh, Harry and um, Megan. Megan, thank you. And then the next time that comes to my mind was when you were standing on the stairs of St. John's after that horrible evening. Right. And when you were talking about leaning into the mess, it's really helpful to have leaders that I, like I just mentioned, that help us lean into it and really get engaged and be proud to be part of your team hmm. and to be part of something that even when we don't know what we're gonna do, I can lean into the church, and the church can help me kind of figure it out. And I hope that um, as we continue to wind through whatever this messy period is, that be it in the globe, in this war that's going on that doesn't make any sense, that somehow we can all figure it out together. I like your, I like your jazz concept. Yeah, thank you for that. The interesting thing about, thank you, um, let me just say a moment, the thing about that, that moment, and, and to, to contextualize it for you, right? I mean, I've, so I've been a bishop for 10 years, um, and I lived through uh, the, I lived through the um, years of the former administration where every day there was something outrageous happening, right? Every day. Um, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I give thanks every morning that the news doesn't start with someone tweeting at four in the morning, right? Right? Do you remember that? That was like the headline, you know? And, um, and, I don't, and, and, and with all due respect to members of, of anyone who might have voted for the president or members of the Republican Party, I'm not, this is not a political statement. This is sort of a, a moral statement. They're worth, and, and frankly, and, uh, and horrifying things are happening every day now, right? And the issue is, when do you step into a public moment and when don't you? Which is just, on some level, it's a, it's a toss of a coin. And, and 
Every one of us who has had an opportunity to do something in public, and I'm not just talking about people with collars on, you know the feeling where 99 times out of 100, you do something and no one notices, right? Or it seems to have zero impact at all, right? Because that's the nature of trying to make a difference in this world. You just do your thing and you don't know anything at all. You just don't know. Like we've been kind of holding up our, our little voices on lots of things right now and you just don't know. Every once in a while, you're standing in a moment and there's like, oh, look at what she's doing, right? She's so brave, right? Well, you know, people have been standing out there. Do you know what I'm saying? I just, I just happened to step into that moment. And the other thing about that moment was it was over in four days, right? And then the world moves on. So I don't take as much. I, I was proud to be there. I was proud to represent the church. But actually, it's the things we do day in and day out that are going to change the arc of things, right? And every once, and once in a while, every one of us are gonna, is going to stand on a moment where we feel like we're riding a wave, which is an amazing feeling. Um, and part of what we celebrate today in Pentecost is that feeling of being on a wave. Like, it's like you're being carried along by something that's bigger than you are, and it's a great feeling. And by the way, it lasts for as long as it lasts, and then it's over. And the next, the next day is kind of what matters most. That's the sort of leaning into the mess part, right? It's like saying something that catches people's attention and then doing the work, right? Um, just as an example, thinking about the anti-racism work, right? Because that was all about race in that moment and we were all gathered and there were thousands of people all across the country and we were all united and a lot of that energy has dissipated and the work is still the work. And so we keep showing up, right? keep showing up and doing what we can, listening, striving. And the same is true in our prayer lives. <laughs> Some days we pray and we feel so connected. And other days, I don't know about you, but I'm still there doing my best, right? In one form or another. So that's the human yin and yang. And, um, and perseverance and resilience comes from the day to day. And every once in a while, we get a moment where we can all say, yes, right? And it's so sweet. And then the next day comes and we go back to work, right? So thank you for that. And I agree with you. And, um, and part of what those moments, I think, are for are meant to give us some sense of, like you said, we're on a team. We're in this together. It matters. And then we go back to our lives of relative anonymity and, and sweat equity, right? Other thoughts? I mean, how long, we, how long do we have, by the way? Uh, seven minutes. Seven minutes, okay. So any other things, any questions you have for me? Anything you'd like to ask? Yes. Come to the mic, of course. Um, so you asked what had become crystal clear, and what became very crystal clear to me during the pandemic as a recently retired public school special education teacher is, um, comes from my faith really. It's the value and the sanctity of each human life. Yes. At the beginning of um, the pandemic, my principal would say to me, Anne, you put your life into this work like it's life and death. It's not life and death. And then one day I opened the newspaper and there in Washington state, they were making COVID calculations of who would receive services and people with intellectual disabilities were not going to receive services. And I thought, that is my work. I also have a daughter with an intellectual disability. She has Down syndrome. And the pandemic really made that clear to me in many other ways besides my work with children with special education. And now, when I address issues, all issues, um, and reflect on the turmoil in our society between gun rights and everything, right. I think about that and the people on maybe the other side of the issue. Mm -hmm. 
and what is their, where are they coming from? Mm -hmm. They are also humans. Right. They also have right. that soul and that value and that sanctity of human life. And I, I, I guess I've become a little less firebrand mm -hmm. and trying to um, understand where they're coming from. Right. Thank you for that. So important. Um, I was actually, Amy and I were chatting the other day about how, what moves a community or a society forward, right? How, how, do, how do ideas that were once impossible to, um, to, to conceive of become normative? Like all of us are old enough, for example, to remember when you could smoke on an airplane, right? You could smoke in a coffee shop, right? There was a non-smoking section, which was like one seat over, right? Remember all that? And do you remember how impossible it, would, it felt when we said, well, yeah, we're going to make everything non-smoking? And how that just, how did that happen, right? How did that happen? And the interesting thing is that it's not one thing, and it's not one approach, and it's not one group of people. But there's usually the firebrands, right? The people who are just dogged about it and will live and die just clamoring that message home, right? They're one group. They're the smallest group. But, they, but they're essential because they hold the vision of whatever it is. It could be the environment. It could be racism. It could be how we care for those who are considered less than human, right? Even though they are fully human. Whatever the issue, these are the people that hold that before us. And then there are all the rest who then are part of the change. And one of the things it's important to know about who we are as people and who we are as a community is what role do we play in that continuum of change, right? Because some people need to hold the banner and other people need to be in relationship with those who hold the banner and relationship with people who think they're slightly crazy, right? Or they're annoying, right? Because these are the people that have the capacity to both be in relationship with the vision and also the capacity to bring a few people along with them who otherwise wouldn't have taken it seriously. Why? Because of who they are and the relationships they have and the authority they carry by virtue of their relationships, right? Does that make sense? And then there are other people who are going to go along because they're, they trust this person, right? Never would have thought of it before. But if you think it's important, I'll at least, I'll at least listen to you, right? Do you hear what I'm saying? And by the time you get to this group of people, you're at, this is, by the way, about 10%. This is about 7 This is about 20 So when you start to get inroads into this group, toward the new idea, you start getting momentum that carries some possibility for people way over here to come along, even though they thought it was a terrible idea, right? Some people will never think it's a good idea, and you'll probably lose them, They'll, you know, or they never will. These people in five years will say, wasn't that a good idea we had to <laughs> take smoking out of that, right? Do you know what I'm saying? And I've been that person, right? Pick your issue from 20 years ago and say, where were you, right? And some of us are called to that visionary place now. Some of us are called to deep relationship and trust because these people here, and certainly these people feel completely judged and discounted by the visionaries. Because, and they're right because the visionaries don't have time for them because if they don't tend to their vision, the vision will die. And they're not willing to let the vision die, right? So we need them. But they're not as interested in the rest of us, right? And I've been that person, right? And these people, do you hear what I'm saying? That's how a society changes. Now, the, the hard thing is it can change for the good and it can change for the not so good, depending on where the powers of equilibrium and relationship go. Because the same dynamic could be true for people who want to do all sorts of things that are not in the interest of humankind, right? And we see that all over the world. And so how we treat one another and how we hold on to the vision that God has given us is paramount. And I can understand why the Apostle Paul called it principalities and powers, because it's bigger, it's bigger than all of us. But we all have a part to play, a really important part, and part of our job is to ask God in the moment, 
What's my role? What can I do from where I am right now? And that's a different question when you're home with young children or when you're caring for an elder or when you yourself are elder or if you're, you're recovering from an illness. It's a very different question when you're feeling at the sort of prime energies and you have time on your hands and you've got energy and, and money and resources to give, right? My role in relationship to social movements is very different as a bishop than it was as an activist, right? And in fact, I, get con I have conversations all the time with activists who want to move me because they know if I, they move me, they think I'm gonna bring a whole bunch of you along with me, right? And I get that. But they have to realize that the only people I can bring along with me are the people who trust me. And that means they have, do you hear what I'm saying? Right? So, it's fascinating. But thank you for your vision, for your commitment, and also for your willingness to recognize that people who don't see the world as you do, um, that one of the positions we can have with them is curiosity and empathy, um, and, and sometimes we agree to disagree and we do go our separate ways, right? But sometimes we hang in and things happen that wouldn't have been possible before. Right. Did I take up the whole seven minutes on that one? All right, well, for, uh, and the Ministry of St. Columbus. <laughs>